That's a, that's a little blob. But well, that didn't sound like happy birthday. <laughs> no, no. That's too hard. Happy birthday box version. Yes. Oh, that's right. Okay. Good stuff today. We're in Mark chapter 13 still. And what's, what's nice about the timing is uh, we will be in the account of the Lord's Supper next Sunday. Which, which sets up nicely since Monday Thursday will be the following Thursday. So we'll, we'll have that text going into our celebration of the institution of the Lord's Supper. But for today, we are still in um, the so-called Olivet Discourse, where, where Jesus is responding to the disciples' question, uh, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished. That's verse 4 of uh, Mark chapter 13. Let's open with prayer. The Lord be with you. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, you open up to us your loving will for us in your word. And we ask your Holy Spirit's guidance as we meditate on your word in this hour uh, by his help, may we better understand your words to us that we may more firmly believe them. In Jesus' name, amen. want to pick up where we left off last time. We, we read all of chapter 13, and we s made, made a few notes before we uh, decided to, to plunge in verse by verse on this. Uh, we said, first of all, that this is known as the synoptic apocalypse. Uh, that is to say, that this is a, uh, a, a removing of the veil. That, that's literally what uh, apocalypse means, a removing uh, of the veil. Hence, the Latin, Revelation. The, the title for the last book of the Bible in Greek is the Apocalypse of John. And that gets translated into English as the revelation of St. John. Uh, the, the, the one word is Greek, the other word is, is Latin. They both mean removing of the veil. Uh, and, and, and so, one way of thinking both about Jesus' words in this chapter, which is parallel to two places in Matthew and Luke, as well as the book of Revelation itself, is that it, it is not necessarily entirely predictive. When, when we read the prophets in the Old Testament, we ought not expect everything the prophets have to tell us is about the future. What, what do prophets do? They, they not so much foretell as forth tell. They speak on God's behalf and they apply oftentimes the current situation. They apply God's word to the current situation. They're, they're taking God's law, God's instruction from especially the books of Moses and applying it to God's people in the present. And sometimes the prophets will say something about something yet to happen. But by and large, what the prophets are doing is they're giving us a divine perspective on events that we otherwise only understand from, from our own. The apocalypse of, of Mark, this Mark chapter 13, the revelation of John, is, is often retelling the whole history of the world. But now with the veil removed, and, and showing us the perspective on natural disasters or the perspective of war from, from the vantage of heaven. That, 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 that's the main thing. And, and I, I think we're going to see that play out in, in Mark chapter 13. Uh, there, there's a couple of, of places that are really good about this in the Old Testament. Remember the judge... Um, Deborah, remember Deborah from the book of Judges? You, you have in the book of Judges an account of a battle 
that Deborah, and I believe it's Barack, that, that uh, uh, successfully wage. And, and, and you get an account of the battle in the same way you, you would expect to read the account of a battle in the American Revolution. But then in, in, the, in the chapter after, you get the Song of Deborah, which retells that whole battle from God's perspective. How God won the battle. God defeated his enemies. Which is true. Both. Both, but two different perspectives. There, there's a place in 2 Kings where Elisha is going through a valley and he's being pursued by the, the king's enemies and his servant is deathly afraid. And Elisha prays and allows his servant to see all the angels camped in the mountains guarding and protecting them. See, it's an unveiling, a revelation. They're there all the time, but we don't get to see them. But in these revelations, these apocalypses, the veil is removed and we do. And that's in many ways what Mark 13 is. We also went through and we asked ourselves, you know, what are some... Some thorny verses in, in this. And, and we said one of them is the one about uh, the Son of Man not knowing. Son of Man's, let's say, ignorance of the time. Okay, the time of the end. What, what, else, did, what, what else were some things that came up in this reading that struck us as Hard to understand, let's say. <clears throat> or, 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 or is it, it, it all, all already clear to you all? And we should just move on to 14. <laughs> well, one was the abomination of desolation. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Yes, the, the abomination of desolation. When you see the abomination of desolation. Anything else? Maybe we didn't identify this last time, but the, the one that I, I think has to come up is verse 30. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Okay? And so, we've got the, the this generation promise. How do we understand that? And then, overall, we've got the big question of, what's it about? What's it about? And, and what are our options? Jesus is giving us this, this discourse in answer to a question posed to him, put to him by Peter, James, uh, uh, John, and Andrew, remember, privately. And they say, tell us when, all these, when these things will be and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished. W what are these things? Could be reference to his crucifixion. But, his okay, why though? Why would that be a natural way to read it? Because I mean, what's the context? What have they just gotten done talking about? Destruction of the temple. Yeah, so much of what's gone on before has had everything to do with the temple. Mm -hmm. the, the, the stripping of authority from the current temple leadership, that's, that's certainly part of the, the more immediate context, if you go back to the parable of the tenants, the wicked tenants. Remember that? Where, where the tenants refused to pay the owner of the vineyard his rent. And they kept beating up or even killing the messengers he sent to collect the rent. Until finally, the question is asked, what do you think that owner is going to do to the, to the tenants? He's going to destroy them and replace them. Uh, so, so we've already got a, a hint that, that in view is, is, is that kind of thing, that the spiritual leaders of Jerusalem are going to be replaced 
The vineyard's going to be turned over to someone else. What else? Just before this, immediately before this, the, the disciples have said, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. Referring to the temple. And Jesus says, Do you see these great buildings? There won't be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. So the actual destruction of the temple is likely part of the, these things. But then we read it. We read all of chapter 13. And how do we understand some of what, at least some of what Jesus says? Is it just about the destruction of the temple? What are some things that, that you would say you have a hard time understanding as referring to the destruction of the temple? How about, how about this? Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. What does that sound like? End times. End, times. end times. End of the world and, and specifically Christ's second coming. Fair enough? So, so we've, got, we've got destruction of Jerusalem in view. Or, or let's say destruction of the temple. But we've also got end of the world. Let's say last judgment. Second coming. And there might yet be a third thing we'll, we'll call other stuff. <laughs> you like that? I was going to say that. We're going to say other stuff? That's the technical term. Okay. Um, Pastor, did they have a, a uh, sense at this time, you know, because he's intertwining, obviously, the temple and end times and all that. Did they have a sense of a second coming even? I mean, there's... Oh, well, I, I, they, they certainly have a sense of the coming of the Messiah. And, and first, with that, first time. but I mean, there's no, they haven't made any kind of logic leap to, even though he's told them. Yes, right. This whole idea of a second coming. Right. Um, I don't know how many of you remember the the interview that I had the privilege of, of, of giving uh, Dr. Veltz way back, you know, early part of the, this COVID uh, craziness, um, where where he was talking about what what made Mark such an appealing subject for him to devote his scholarly career on. And one of them was this, that, that uh, one of the teachers he studied under pointed out how Mark, which is often uh, treated as the, the most uh, rudimentary, uh, simplest, um, least elegant of the Gospels, that there's a depth to Mark that gets missed. And, and that one of the many profound things that is in Mark, not so much in the others, is that Jesus is, is uh, Elijah to himself in the Gospel of Mark. That this comes out in so many ways. That we think of who's the Elijah figure? Who's the fulfillment of Elijah? If we would say... John the Baptist, right? But at, at some point in Mark, John the Baptist ceases to be the, the, the forerunner to Jesus. Jesus is himself his own forerunner. How so? He's got two comings. He comes first to be the Savior by dying on the cross, and then he will come again at the consummation of the age to, to finally, once for all, fully restore everything. And, and so he ends up being the herald of himself. And, and, and he's doing that among other, in other, among other places here. Uh, so that would be a surprise to them. They would expect when the Messiah comes, he doesn't need to come twice. Right. Uh, and, and so th this has got to lead to a lot of scratching of the head, th th this discourse. Pretty solid uh, example of being a herald is when he tells people, "Don't tell anybody something." 
Yeah, right. Yeah. The, the so-called messianic secret. That's right. That's right. That it's not. It's not yet time. There will be a time, but it, it hadn't come at that point. That's right. Uh, anything else? Let, let's start with because uh, it's going to come up so much. <clears throat> Since this is the issue that gets Jesus in so much trouble, ultimately, what he has to say about the temple, and you know, now there's there's no getting around it when he says this thing's coming down, no stone upon another. Why would that be so offensive to hear? I mean, put yourselves in the shoes of a pious Jew living at that time. I mean, we, we read it from the perspective of, well, it's about time someone did something about those good-for-nothing Sadducees, chief priests, and elders. But put that aside. That's not how the average pious Jew is thinking about the temple at this point. For Jesus to come along and say, I tell you, this, this thing's going to be raised to the ground so that one stone is not left upon another... Why is that so, I mean, almost blasphemous to hear? Ray? The temple represents the presence of God. Yes! The temple is the place where God promised to meet His people. Uh, so that throughout the Old Testament, I, I love that passage in... in um, uh, is it... Uh, is it it's Exodus... Where, where Moses says, look, if, 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 we have, if we have prosperity, but you aren't with us, what's the point? You know, if, if we got all the, all the good things of the land, and yet you left us, it, it would be all for nothing. That, that your being present with us is everything. And, and where was that place? It, 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 for Moses, it was the tabernacle, and then, then from Solomon onwards, it was the temple, uh, and the holy of holies of the temple. Now, now let's think about that in, in our own context. The temple's been destroyed. Where do we find God? See, we've we got to be careful here, uh, because... The, the, the answer a lot of us have could have been the answer a lot of Jews had, but a good Jew would have corrected them. What, 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 what's, the, what's the average man on the streets answer to the question, where do you find God? In the church. In the, the average man on the street. Oh. In heaven. In the... Okay. In heaven. But, but what do we know about God? God is everywhere. 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 But is that where you find Him? See, it's a difference. There's a difference. In the same way that we might say, the, the, the radio, the radio waves are in the air at all times. But how do you tune in? Do, do, you, you see the difference? Yeah, I mean, the, the radio is always on somewhere, everywhere, and yet that does you no good if you're not tuned in to a particular station listening. And so it is with God. God is everywhere, absolutely. But He promises to meet us. He makes Himself tune inable in the church, where the sacraments are, where His Word is proclaimed. You see? And, and so this was the Jews', the Jews highest privilege, highest honor, is that God had condescended to say, I'm going to be here for you. And only here, and only for you. And that, that was the, the whole dedication of the temple by Solomon. Was, was making that point. You, you, you're the God of heaven and earth. Nothing can contain you. And yet you choose to be contained in this place. So that as we pray facing this place, as we enter this place praying to you, we have confidence that you're not going to kill us as you should, as you have every right to do, but instead will be gracious toward us and hear our prayers and answer them in the best way, 
You'll forgive us our sins. You'll grant us those things that we need to support this body and life. I mean, that, that's all there in the dedicatory prayer. This, this, this paradox of God being higher than heaven and earth. And yet, He deigns to locate Himself in a box. You know, it's not like the, you know, the, the Jews didn't get it. Or, you know, that's often a credit, you know, the, what, what a primitive religion these, you know. No, no. They, they, they get it as much as the, Greek, the great Greek philosophers did. That God is everywhere. That God is ubiquitous. And yet, God makes a promise in such a way that He confines Himself. And think of the sacraments in that way. We're, we're, we get to tune in to God and know His gracious will for us because He promises to be in this water or promises to be in, these, in, in this bread and wine for the forgiveness of our sins. Okay? So, so now Jesus is saying, that's going to be taken away from you. No more. This is huge. No wonder they, they quickly got their people together and said, this guy's got to go. <clears throat> okay? Um, Alright. So, starting with verse 4... Tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them. Now remember, here the question is, when? And that's the one question he never answers. <laughs> but we're about to get 30 verses of him never answering the question. And, and, and so... And, and that's a helpful thing about reading the Bible in, in general, isn't it? That we come to the Bible with all of our questions. And part of what being open to God's Word means is allowing God to tell you you're asking the wrong ones. That, that the Bible asks more questions of us in, 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 from a certain point of view than, than, than we ask of it. Because we're the ones that need to be questioned. We're, we're the ones that need to be put in the dock and, and challenged so that then the Bible can give us the answers to the questions we should be asking. Namely, how can I find a gracious God? Or, or how can God possibly forgive me my sins? How can I possibly have life with this God uh, given, given who I am and what I've done? Um, so Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. Are you following along in your, in your Greek, Kyle? Not very well. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So earthquakes, you'll love this. Seismoi. Right? So a seismometer is literally a measurement of, of, of an earthquake from, from, from the, the Greek word seismos. Uh, meaning like a, a trembling. Uh, but uh, did you find it? No. It's, it's going to be in verse... Uh, verse 8. Yeah, yeah, verse 8. Yeah, 13, verse 8. I don't even have it out. Here, here it is. Uh, yeah, yeah, and then in the second half, Esantai Seismoi, Katatapus. Okay, got it. So, so and, and there will be earthquakes at, at places, literally, right? A tapos is, is a place. And, and there will be famines, beginning of, of, uh, of birth pangs, these things. Is, is that what you got? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and about, uh, about some of this, we, we, we looked at, I believe we did, uh, Isaiah 19, that, that this language is to be found uh, in, in the Old Testament. Isaiah 19, we've got an oracle against Egypt, judgment on Egypt, in which um, it says in verse 2, I will stir up Egyptians against Egyptians and they'll fight each against another and each against his neighbor, city against city, kingdom against kingdom. 
and the spirit of the Egyptians within them will be emptied out. I will confound their counsel, and so forth. So we've got God bringing judgment on, on, on a, an enemy, and, and, and part of that judgment entails wars, and kingdom set against kingdom. Uh, likewise, if you turn to Second Chronicles, we're never in the, we're, we, we never look at the Chronicles, do we? We should. Good stuff. Second Chronicles, and look at, look at chapter 15. Uh, this is, um, uh, okay, uh, Second, uh, Second Chronicles 15, and as part of a warning to the king of Judah, uh, and a reminder of what, what God does to even to His own people when, when they rebel and, and, and turn away from Him. Uh, look at verse 5. In those times there was no peace to Him who went out or to Him who came in, for great disturbances afflicted all the inhabitants of the lands. They were broken in pieces. pieces. Nation was crushed by nation and city by city, for God troubled them with every sort of distress. Uh, but you take courage, do not let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. Let's see, hang, hang on, higher than that. Uh, did I, I thought I talked about them being uh, hungry. Did, did I miss it? I know I saw this, Second Chronicles 15. I talked about them being hungry, I thought. Oh well. But you, you've got nation against nation, city against city again. Uh, so, so th- this is language that's going to be familiar to the disciples. Prophetic language regarding God's judgment. Um, and and what, what does he say about this? He says, this stuff's going to happen, but it isn't the end. It's just the birth pains. Uh, and, and in some cases, it's, it's Braxton Hicks. Don't even go to the hospital about it. Right? These are but the beginning of the birth pains. And, and you could even, you, you can go through the, the, the history of, of Israel between, say, A.D. 30, around the time Jesus must have said these words, and A.D. 70, when Jerusalem was uh, destroyed. And, and you're going to find all manner of earthquakes, n- not necessarily in Israel, but certainly in the empire, in, 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 the, uh, you know, in, in the known world. Uh, you, you, wars, you, you've got nations rising up, wars even between the Romans and the Jews until finally the, the Romans come through and, 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 and put an end to it. Uh, so, so Jesus warns them ahead of time regarding these things that these things are going to happen between now and then, but as they happen, don't think that this is it. These are but the beginning of the, of the birth pains. But be on your guard. There it is again. Be on your guard. For they will deliver you over to councils. So the word there is san, you know, the sanhedra, you know, the, the sanhedron, the, 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 the same kind of body that Jesus was brought before, that St. Paul was brought before, uh, that we know that the apostles will be brought before. Uh, you'll be beaten in synagogues. Okay. Now, 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 think about this. Councils and synagogues we're going to associate with whom? What, 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 what people? The Jews. But now, notice, and you will stand before governors and kings. Who are they? Romans. Yeah, yeah, Romans, Gentiles. So we've got both there, and, and in that order. They're going to be brought before Jewish ruling authorities. They'll be brought before Gentile ruling authorities. To bear... Okay. And you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. So we've got persecution, but for a purpose. What's the persecution going to give them opportunity to do? Witness. To bear witness. To, to, to proclaim Christ as, as Lord. Um, by the way, what's the word for witness? Do we know this? What's, what's the Greek word 
for witness. Kyle. <laughs> That's exactly right. Martyr. That you will be martyrs. And John the Baptist is he, he's, he's, he wasn't the Christ. He isn't the Word. He, but he bore witness. He was a martyr. Now, we, when we think of martyr, we think of what? what, 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 what how would we define martyr? Dying for a cause. Yeah, that a martyr necessarily <clears throat> dies for usually a religious cause. Uh, but, but martyr in the original sense is just witness. You don't necessarily have to die to be a... John, the Apostle John, as far as we know, was the only of the original twelve apostles who did not die a... a uh, was not killed. Uh, he died a natural death. And yet he was still a martyr in the original Greek sense of the word insofar as he bore witness to Christ. Um... But 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 that's 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 the word. So um, we we've got we've got persecution. We have bearing witness, and notice this: the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. The gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. Now here's one of if if, if we're you know keeping score. And, and, and we're lining up these verses and saying, ah, oh, this has got to be about destruction of the temple. This has got to be about end of the world. Okay? This verse makes it difficult to think it's all, to, to, to lead you to believe that it's all about destruction of the temple. Because certainly by AD 70, the gospel had not been proclaimed to all nations, it had not spread that far yet. That kind of thing. Um, the, the, the other thing to, to say about this is, we, we know this, Matthew, if I said uh, Great Commission, that's not my favorite uh, way of thinking about it, but it, it's stuck, thanks to the Baptists. Uh, but the Great Commission, Matthew 28, what, what, what is the Great Commission? Go and make disciples of all nations, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Lo, I am with you to the end of the age. Right? Uh, Luke has equivalent words. If you look at Luke 24, and this is... Um, Verse uh, 24, verse 46, he said to them, Thus it's written that Christ should, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And notice, you are witnesses. You are witnesses of these things. Um, so, Matthew and Luke both have something like what we would consider the Great Commission. Mark does not. But Mark does have this. Mark does have Jesus saying as, as part of the Olivet Discourse, the Gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. Now, now just press pause on, on that much so far. They've asked a question about when's this stuff going to happen? And, and, and so far, <laughs> what's Jesus' answer? There'll be a lot of signs. Yeah. Although he's, he's careful to say, e even this stuff, they're, they're like signs of the signs. Right? Even the stuff I'm telling you about, is, it's like an anti-sign. He, he's like warning them not to think this stuff's the sign. It's not. He's telling us more about the stuff that isn't a sign than, than the stuff that, that, that is. But, but what else? You know, what's his main point so far? If, if you were to reduce what he said so far to one message, what's he getting across to these disciples? We're in the end times already. We're in the end times already. Could you yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Uh, 
but and, and what what about that? If we're in the end times already, how how ought they conduct themselves? As witnesses, I mean, bad stuff's going to happen from this day forward. And that bad stuff is happening so as to give you an opportunity to proclaim me. So persecution and witness go hand in hand. Um, he, he also, you know, we have this warning about people coming and, and claiming to be him or claiming to be a savior and, and not, not to believe them. Um, the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations and when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, and the word for deliver is the same word for when they deliver Jesus over. Judas is going to do this to him. <laughs> do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour for it's not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And, and we see that play out over and over and over again in the book of, of Acts. That when the apostles stand up before their accusers, over and over again it will say, and Peter by the Holy Spirit said. Or um, uh, uh, James in the Holy Spirit said. And brother will... Del so, so up to this point, we've had kind of conflict with the authorities, whether they're Jewish authorities or Gentile authorities, now the conflict's within the family. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated. Now, you'll, you'll like this, Kyle. So, so what's the word for hated? This is in, uh, in 13. Uh, misuminoi. Okay, you, you, so, so we have words like misanthrope, a hater of mankind, uh, misogyny, is the hatred of women. So it comes from this, this miso word, meaning, meaning, meaning hatred. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Yeah. Anybody have something different there? Because I think certain translations turn that into survive. And, and, and it's the saved word. But, but saving has this broad connotation of to be well, to be safe, to be healthy, to be intact, to be whole. And, and so the, the translators have that, that license to, to go uh, in, a, in a narrower or broader way with the word, to be sure. And, and, that, and that, that raises the question of, in, in, the middle, in the immediate context, it could sound like the promise is, certain of you won't get killed. But that's probably not the promise here. Because he's saying, you will get killed. Right? Uh, parents will, will uh, children will have their parents put to death, presumably over their Christian belief. Right? The, the, the children will turn their believing parents into the authorities and, and, and have them rounded up and so forth. And, and so those parents who endure to the end will still die, but will be saved, will rise again. That, that, I think that's the way to go, and so I, I'm, I'm glad for, for the ESV to go with saved versus survive. No, no one has that? In, I mean, I know a lot of us are using ESV. Okay. Now we get to, to, to one of the big questions, right? When you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be. What's an abomination? What, what, what does that mean in the Bible, an abomination? An insult. Okay, an insult. I think it's even stronger than that. When you, when you go back to God's law, and, and He talks about things that are abominable, what, what are we talking about? Desecration, kind of? I mean, not really. Okay, yes. I mean, 
Again, the, the, the temple is the place where God has promised to meet His people. And so there are a lot of rules protecting the, the holiness, the, the set-apartness of that place. But it's an abomination to the Lord isn't just stuff having to do with the temple. And there's a whole list of things that God considers an abomination. They tend to be things like incest, um, against his will, really, isn't it? Yeah, but, but there, there are things that, that particularly disgust God, that, that he finds particularly repulsive. That, that, that's how that abomination word shows up. That so yes, the, yes, all worse. things are offensive to God, and yet God will single out certain things and say, this is an abomination to me. You know, that's bad enough, but here's a way to be made clean a, a, after it's happened. This over here, th this is an abomination, and uh, th there, there's very little that can be done to make up for an abomination. Rejection of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, al although I don't know that, those, that that language ever gets gets used in that same context as the unforgivable sin, that kind of thing. But it's something terribly repulsive to God. Let, let's put it that way. And then desolation. What about that desolation? What, 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 what is a desolation? Destruction. Not destruction. When, when something's desolate, what is it? Isolated. Yeah, isolated, empty, uninhabited. So it's the same word for desert. It, 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 it's something like the abomination that makes a desert. Something like that. It, the, the eremos is, is, is the word. So, so John goes out into this word when, when he, he preaches and baptizes. Um, and and it, it's tough because you've got one of these, these phrases where the, the of part can be made, can be understood in a whole bunch of different ways. And, and without going through the weeds, let's just say, Probably the, the, the best way of understanding this is it's an abomination that causes this, that leads to this. How so? Things are going to be so bad in the temple by this act of disgust, this disgusting act that takes place in it, that everyone will flee the temple and leave it empty. Now, Historically, even before these words were said, we had just such an event in the period of the Maccabees. And in fact, in the time, at the time, it, it was considered an abomination of desolation. And that phrase, by the way, it shows up uh, several times in Daniel, and maybe the most um, familiar one is, is Daniel 7. Go to Daniel 7. Uh, am I missing it? Let's see. No, go, go to Daniel 9. I'm sorry. Daniel 9. So, um... You, you, you've got all this prophecy of, of future kingdoms and a, and a, and a prince that's going uh, to, at a certain at a certain period, do some bad things. And the people of the prince, this is verse uh, 26, the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with the flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. He shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. For half a week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate. So this was interpreted to have been fulfilled in the days of the Maccabees when Antiochus Epiphanes, who's uh, uh, you know, an Egyptian uh, ruler, uh, comes in or, or, or is uh, like a satrap of, of, of the Egyptian dynasty, uh, he comes in and makes himself 
high priest of the temple. So we've got a pagan. We, 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 we've got, you know, it's bad enough to have a non-Levite and yet still a Jew act as high priest. Uh, but here we've got a pagan entering into the, uh, entering into the temple and, and performing rites according to his pagan religion. Abomination of desolation. This leads to the Maccabean revolt and so forth. Um, but we also know from Josephus that, you know, a couple of things. One, a pagan statue was set up in the temple around 66, 67. And this was one of the escalating events, one of the events that helped precipitate the, the, what, what led to the destruction of Jerusalem because the, the pious Jews revolted at this sacrilege. And, and then the Romans had to, to step up their defense and, uh, and, and their control of the city and so forth until finally the, the Romans plowed the whole thing. But no, notice um, also two, two other things. One, um, the, the, I, I think it was the Romans, according to Josephus, who, who just picked a guy, a guy named Phani, P-H-A-N-N-I, to, to be the high priest. And oh, did this upset all the Jews because he might have, this Phani may have been a Jew, but he wasn't a Levite and knew nothing, knew nothing about being a priest. Okay? And, and so this was a huge offense to, to all the Jews and also was one of those things that, that, that ticked them off and, and, and created you know, more rioting and, and so forth. Um, but, but understanding this installation of Phani, P-H-A-N-N-I, as the abomination of desolation makes a lot of sense to a lot of scholars for this reason. Look at, but when you see the abomination of desolation standing where, what does it say? He, he, not it, where he ought not to be. And and, and scholars say, this is pretty significant given the word for abomination is neuter. It should be it. But now we're, we're seeing the abomination of desolation is a person. Get it? So it's not necessarily the statue. That'd be an it. But he stands. He stands. Um, and, and then the second thing is, look at that interesting parenthetical. Let the reader understand. What to do with that? What, 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 do, you, what do you think about that? That's very unusual. We have not seen this before in the Gospel of Mark. A, a, a let the reader understand kind of side note. And, and you got the question of, is, did Jesus say that originally? Is that part of Jesus' own quotes? Or is, is it is it Mark, the, the, the author of the book, kind of putting it in parentheses himself? Is it just what you talked about, the it versus he thing? How so? If, well, you were just explaining to us the difference between a neutered it and a person he. Right. Is that what they're trying to help you understand? Oh, yeah. yeah I Because it, it comes after the whole thing. Right? And when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand. What, what might that be signaling? Yeah, and I don't think it's as fine a point as that. You know, and let the reader understand, I just used the male personal pronoun, <laughs> not the neuter one. Right? Well, if it's, <laughs> it, it's good enough for our class, yeah. But see, we're so far removed... That we've got to get in the weeds a little bit in a way that the original hearers of this would not. Well, I guess the first question is, who's the reader? And I, I always like asking that because, again, the Gospel of Mark was probably not originally read. Not the way you and I read. Do, do, do you realize how... Strange, uh, an era we're in, where everybody can read and read privately. 
I mean, Augustine, who died in 430, talks about how unusual Ambrose was to meet this man who could read privately. He could read silently. You, you didn't do that. You, you had to read out loud because you had to hear where the words broke, where, where the syllables broke, because there were no spaces between the words and that kind of thing. Now, that's what's going on with the, the Ethiopian eunuch, right? And, and, and he asked Philip for help, right? And, uh, Philip heard him reading, it says, because that's how you read. You read out loud, okay? Uh, but but in, in, in only those few who could. And we're, we're talking literacy rates of maybe maybe 15%. So how, how was the Gospel of Mark originally communicated? Orally. Orally. By a reader. See, that's the reader. And, and elsewhere in the New Testament, uh, I think at the end of um, Revelation, it says something along the lines of, and, and blessings to the one who reads and to the one who hears. In other words, that this letter is going to go out and it's going to be read by a messenger. God bless him, and God bless the rest of you who hear him. So now that's interesting. So why would let the reader understand? What's he to understand? Well, could it be this? And understand can take the meaning of um, reflect on, take to heart. Not just put two and two together and get, and, and get four, but, but understand in the sense of reflect on and, 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 and take seriously. So you've got a reader being sent maybe to a group of hearers not far from the abomination of desolation. What should he be wary of? The things Jesus is going to say are about to happen. You, you follow that? Let, let the reader, let the reader himself who's taking this message now, this message that Jesus originally spoke back in 30, but guess what? We're already starting to see part of it fulfilled. Namely, this funny guy, he's in the temple. Or if, it, if it's a reference to the statue, that, that, that pagan statue is in the temple now, which means it's not going to be long before this other bad stuff happens. Reader, be careful. Isn't that kind of... It fits, doesn't it? I think it, I think it does. Uh, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. When the abomination of desolation comes, get out of there. Flee to the mountains. Let the one who's on the housetop not go down. Uh, nor enter his house to take anything out. You don't have time. Uh, let the one who's in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, why so? But why is it going to be woe on those who are pregnant at the time? Their mobility. Yeah, it hinders their mobility. See, all, all these things have to do with things that stand in the way of you getting out of town as fast as you can. Um, pray that it may not happen in winter. What, what's in winter? Yeah, a lot of rain. Yeah, yeah, bad roads. That's right. For in those days, uh, no power, no water. <laughs> and and, and uh, see, see, you know, between 5 and 40% of their grid was wind and solar. So d depending on which, uh, which news channel you watch. <laughs> so that was a problem. Uh, um, uh, but, but Peter was safe. He went to Cancun. <laughs> his family demanded it his mother-in-law his mother-in-law said we got to get out of here <laughs> what good could he have done staying in Jerusalem alright um, for in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be and if the Lord had not cut short the days no human being would be saved but for the sake of the elect whom he chose he shortened the days and then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or look, there he is, don't believe it. 
For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard. I've told you all things beforehand. Alright? So we've got on guard again. Be on guard. This is the second of three be on guards in this, uh, in this entire chapter. I want to come back to that in a second. But uh, this, I, I, I think, and again, I don't want to prejudice you, but nearly all of this can be seen as referring to the destruction of Jerusalem. And, and Brian brought up last week how if you were to read in Josephus his account of the destruction of Jerusalem, yeah, it, it, is, it, it is very, 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 you know, grisly descriptions of what the Romans, you know, did to the, you know, not just the men, not just the fighting men, but the women and the children. Um, you, you got this for the sake of the elect, he shortened the days. But what, what, what might that be saying? I think I, it's so good that we're, we're hearing this in context. Right? That, that, that we, I hear that verse a lot out of context. And, and it, it, you know, it plays into rapture kind of uh, schemes for the end times. But is that really what it's talking about? For the sake of the elect, he shortened the days. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Or, what, 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 what do you think, Ray? Your suffering has is, is been shortened. Yes, yes, so, something like that. Uh, that, that... Um, it's going to be really bad, but the duration will be limited. It will not go on forever. And why will it not go on forever? For the sake of the elect. That, that, that they're going to suffer too. You know, some of the elect will be among those stuck on those muddy roads who, who, get, who get killed and, and run, run through by the Romans. Um, for their sake, this will not go on. And, and, and you know, someone commenting on this points out that remember the thousand year Reich it was only 12 years. See, God, God cut it short. It, it didn't last a thousand years. This went on for about two. I mean, it was really, really bad and, and then, you know, just horrifying at the very end for about two years. But not longer than that. But in those days, after that tribulation... The sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then He will send out the angels and gather His elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. What does that sound like? That sounds more like the end of the world and second coming and so forth. Uh, Son of Man is, is... We've seen this before, a way of Jesus referring to Himself. Um, these the sun being darkened, we got, we got cosmic um, uh, phenomena here that get referred to in, 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 at Pentecost. Peter will, will cite Joel and say, look, these things have happened. These things are happening as a sign of a new era. The Savior has come. Jesus of Nazareth has been raised. And, and now the power of the resurrection has, has entered into the world. And, and there's going to be a, a restoration of all things. And, and these kind of cosmic events are signs pointing to that. And, and so he, here's, the, here's the challenge of these verses is that they could apply to a lot of things. But we seem to, we're, we're talking about things that will happen after that tribulation. After that tribulation. And then finally we get the, the fig tree. And the fig tree learns its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that it is near, not he. Although it could be he, but I think it makes more sense. At the very gates, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. All right, I, I'm already over time. Let me at least get this point in so we don't have too much more of this next week. Um, unless you want to talk about it some more. Um, but uh, for the fig tree, learn its lesson. When's the last time we saw a fig tree? Previous chapter. Previous chapter. Jesus curses the fig tree. And, and, and it's withered the next day. And that's all in connection with his doing what where? 
cleansing, cleansing the temple. Cleansing the, the fig tree is a sign of the temple. Okay? Now, let, let's think about ju- just, just the, the agricultural image itself. What's another way of putting this? He's saying, look, you, you know the way it works with the fig tree. That, that, that you know summer is near because what's happening with the fig tree? It's, it, it, it's leafing. It's leafing. Okay? Now, we've got fig tree. We've got all the stuff he's just, just said. We've got summer's coming. He's just described a lot of bad stuff. Temples destroyed. Jerusalem's destroyed. A lot of people got killed in horrible ways. How should we look at it? Leafing. It's leafing. We're nearer our salvation. This is, these are signs of our restoration. We've got judgment happening, but it's not judgment on us who are in Christ. It's a sign that summer is just around the corner. You know, just like they say, you know, it's always darkest before dawn, right? But some, you know, so, so some congressman I recently read said, you know, it's always darkest right before it's pitch black. <laughs> no, that's not true. No, no, it's darkest before dawn. The, the fig tree image is like that. <laughs> that take all these things and see how they're connected? See, the fig tree takes you back to the temple. You're going to see the temple destroyed. That, that destruction of the temple is itself a sign that God's doing His thing of restoring the heavens and the earth through Him, through Jesus. Yeah. Doesn't that make it, doesn't that fit in a way? Now, it, it, and, but now we've got the whole issue of, okay, but then how much longer after that? won't tell us. <laughs> Concerning that, I don't even know. That, that's, that's what he's going to say, right? So we're back to be on guard. Always be ready. You don't know when. Your life should be lived continually in the posture of repentance and faith. Knowing that even when you see bad stuff happening, it can be opportunity for evangelism. Right? But it's also a sign that the, the, the happy ending is just around the corner. <coughs> Remember the lesson of the fig tree. And, and I'll, I'll say just a little bit more about that, how we've got kind of two layers here. Right? We've got signs of the temple, right, being destroyed. But then the temple being destroyed is itself a sign of... the. You, you've got judgment and restoration, in a sense, with the destruction of the temple. But then that itself is a sign of judgment and restoration happening all over the earth. Because now the thing goes out to everybody. The Gentiles too. You know, so that everybody is brought into right relationship with God. But through this same process of a two-track way of restoration, but also judgment. Restoration for those who are with Christ. Judgment on those who are opposed to Him. But now instead of it playing out just among the Jerusalemites or just among the Jews, it will play out in, in the whole world. Okay, and so, just as the Jews did not heed the, the lesson about the temple, right? all of us now must, must heed the warning about the, the, the end, the, the judgment that will come on all of us who are, who are not in Christ. Alright, let's close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time you have given us in your word. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that uh, you are so gracious to speak to us, to warn us ahead of time of the signs that are to come so that we might be ready always uh, to uh, give a defense of our hope and our confidence in your Son, Jesus, and to be ready for that day in which he takes us to be with you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.